My name is uh, Chinmoy Banerjee, otherwise known as Chin, uh, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, and to thank you for coming to this event this afternoon. Uh, on behalf of Sansad, South Asian Network for Secularism and Democracy, which is organizing this event, um, of course, I'm enormously grateful to Sanjay for coming out to talk to us about his wonderful book, Witness Kashmir, and uh, for, to Samir, Samir Gandesha, for agreeing to moderate and to, uh, to, to uh, engage in a conversation with uh, Sanjay on the issue of photography, its role as witness, and its function, enormously important function in memory, and uh, I'll pass it on to Samir uh, as soon as I finish, but it's my uh, pleasure, it's my honor to thank a few organizations. First of all, Hari Sharma Foundation for supporting this event uh, financially. Of course, without funds, we can't do anything. So Hari Sharma Foundation has been very generous in supporting us. And to the Institute for the Humanities at Simon Fraser University, again, without whose help it would be impossible to carry on doing socially uh, important, educational, informative work. Uh, our goal is basically to create an informed public, to inform people about what is going on in South Asia, to educate them about, the, uh, about these events, to create a general sense of, uh, of the need to be alert to democratic issues, uh, democracy, which is severely under threat in many parts of the world, in South Asia, certainly, and in India, hugely. And uh, Kashmir is the latest example of uh, how stressed that whole notion of uh, freedom is and democracy is. Uh, where a whole people can be virtually imprisoned. Uh, and I'm not going to carry on about that because uh, Sanjay will talk about it, explain to us for the 30 years, 30 year history of what has been happening in Kashmir, which has culminated in this present situation of imprisonment. And I'll let Samir take over and elaborate further on this and to introduce Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chin. Thank you so much, Chin. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to be part of uh, this event um, uh, this afternoon. I was just telling Chin that I thought that uh, there were probably other candidates better suited to to doing this um, conversation, but I'm, I'm really delighted that he, uh, uh, he gave me the nod and I have the opportunity to um, uh, enter into a conversation um, with uh, Sanjay, who's, who's uh, an amazing uh, filmmaker, uh, writer, and, and editor, and has produced a, a phenomenal book. Um, uh, congratulations, by the way, Sanjay. It's really uh, uh, remarkable. Um, uh, text that, uh, that you have in, in front of us. And, and there will be copies, by the way, for purchase, and Sanjay will tell you all about that in a second. Um, before I go any further, I'd just like to um, uh, acknowledge that we are uh, on the um, uh, unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil nations. Um, I think that acknowledgement is always important to do, but it's especially important when we're talking about a topic such as Kashmir, where what's involved um, uh, really at the heart of the matter is a kind of renewed and redoubled uh, form of settler colonialism in, in the Indian context and the South Asian context. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, before I go on to introduce uh, Sanjay and talk a little bit about the format uh, for the afternoon, uh, I'd just like to make a couple of announcements about things that uh, are, are coming up. Um, before I do that, though, I, I would just like to um, uh, make a special acknowledgement of, um, of, of all the, the work, um, the tremendous energy, uh, the imagination and vision uh, of uh, Chin Banerjee, who has just been um, an incredible... 
an incredible force uh, in this part of the world for, for decades, and, and I hope for decades to come. Um, it's always a pleasure to uh, be able to work with, uh, with Sansad and Hari Sharma, um, and um, this is one of you know, many events now that we've, uh, we've worked on together, and I, I really look forward to doing more collaborations in the future. I think it's uh, um, uh, terrific insofar as we really share this, um, uh, this impulse to, and really it's a mission of the, the Institute, it's a mission of uh, the, the two organizations to engage the public in this critical um, uh, manner. There's so little of that happening today from, from what I can see. Um, so on that, uh, on that note, I just want to mention a couple of uh, events that, uh, that are coming up um, in the not too distant future. Uh, on the 28th of this month, 28th of November, um, I will be entering into a similar kind of discussion uh, with uh, Newton, uh, Dr. Newton Duarte, who is our um, visiting scholar um, with his wife. His wife is also here at the Institute as a visiting scholar uh, from Brazil. Um, and we will be discussing um, the situation in Brazil, and I think a degree of that conversation was, is now going to go to the um, uh, recently released uh, um, uh, Lula and, and his fortunes in the coming months, and I think that should really be interesting for the opposition. So Newton's back there, Newton and Elaine uh, Duarte, and they're there with the, the family. So um, we're looking forward to that. On the 29th, um, so the, next, the, the day after that, we have a day-long symposium on uh, the legacy of Theodore Adorno, uh, one of the key members of the Frankfurt School, and this is commemorating sort of 50 years after his uh, death. Um, obviously, in his work, there's a, uh, a particular kind of um, correlation uh, of the relationship between politics and aesthetics, and that's one of the, 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 the key topics that uh, we hope to uh, address uh, today in, in our discussion. Um, and one thing that Sarah Schneiderman um, from UBC wanted me to uh, uh, remind you of is a talk uh, by Mona Ban, um, who will be speaking on infrastructures of occupation dams, development, and the politics of integration in Kashmir. I think it would be of interest to uh, many, if not everyone, in the room. And that'll be on November 25th at UBC. Um, I don't have the, the time for that here, but just look it up. So that's something to think about. Um, good, so without uh, any further ado, I would like to move on now to introduce Sanjay and then also to tell you a little bit about our format and then we can get into uh, the afternoon's proceedings. Uh, so Sanjay Kak is an independent documentary filmmaker and writer whose recent work includes the films Red Ant Dream from 2013 about the persistence of the revolutionary ideal in India. Uh, Jasen uh, Azadi, How We Celebrate uh, Freedom, 2007, about the idea of freedom in Kashmir, and words on water about the struggle against the Narmada um, uh, dams in central India. In 2017, he curated, edited, and published the critically acclaimed photo book, Witness Kashmir, 1986-2016, which we are, we're going to be discussing now, uh, Nine Photographers, published independently under the imprint of Yarbal Books. He is the editor of the anthology, Until My Freedom Has Come, the New Intifada in Kashmir, and that's Penguin, uh, India, 2011, and Haymarket Books, the, uh, United States, 2013. A self-taught filmmaker, he writes occasional uh, political commentary and reviews books that he is passionately engaged by. He has been active within the uh, documentary cinema movement in India and with the Cinema of Resistance Project. Um, so what we're going to do today, so the format is, is really as follows. Um, Sanjay is going to speak for about 20, 25 minutes uh, about, uh, about the book, and then um, we will have a uh, uh, conversation, which should be about 25 minutes to uh, half an hour, and then, you know, depending how things go, if you want to you know, keep it going for a bit longer, we'll, we, can, uh, we can do that. But then we'll open it up for um, discussion. Uh, at Institute events, the discussion period, I think, is the most important because people then will have an opportunity to, to speak and, and, and engage um, with uh, um, the, the material. So without any further ado, I'll sure. turn the floor over to Sanjay. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Sansad and SFU for 
setting it all up. Um, it's difficult sometimes to anticipate um, where to begin with an audience, like who's coming from where uh, and where to start. But uh, I just want to say that um, I'm not, uh, I, don't, I don't have a long history of working with photography, for example. Uh, but when I was researching this film that uh, Samir referred to called Jashne Azadi, um, at one stage I was having a bit of a difficult time in getting people to speak at all about the past. And the past was the 90s, which were a particularly dark period uh, in uh, Kashmir's contemporary. And um, because pe it, the, the, today you can actually get people to talk about what it was like. But in those years, when I was trying to make this film in 2003, 2004, I couldn't. So I began looking for material. And uh, it's a long story, which we don't need to get into. But I, looked, I found the work of some photographers. And... I was really amazed at, I knew them, I knew their work, I had seen it in the front pages of the newspapers, but then to just see somebody's work of a few years was just astonishing, you know. It just had a completely different meaning. And um, I just had this sort of fantasy saying, wow, someday someone should do a book out of this. Um, eventually, if we rush forward several pages of the script, um, I just got an email from somebody in Europe from a foundation which said, would you like to come up with a, you know, what they called, I think, uh, a collaborative arts practice. I think it's a fashionable word these days. Um, coming out of Kashmir, and I said, well, I don't have a collaborative idea, but I have a curatorial idea, and this is it. And I w Because I'm saying this because, you know, bringing out a book is an expensive business, and a photo book is a very expensive business. So, um, so we had some money. But eventually, uh, I... I realized that I would not find a publisher in India because there are not too many publishers who do photo books. There are not too many publishers uh, who do fat 400-page photo books. And there are certainly no publishers who do fat 400-page photo books on Kashmir, you know, uh, um, unless they're landscapes and, you know, uh, how charming. So eventually, I actually uh, published it myself. And um, I, I'm bringing this on the table because I think the, the, the longer conversation around what is being spoken of today, all of this matters there. Uh, it explains why I not only chose to publish it, but eventually I distribute the book myself. Because I realized that the, the book distribution business is a complete scam in India. So I would never see any money. So I said, well, I'll do it myself. So that explains why I lug as many copies as I can in my baggage and uh, sell them because that's how it's going to move. Otherwise, you know, it's not going to be possible. So uh, what I have is a small um, uh, variable timing, but say 20, 25 minute, uh, like a PowerPoint, uh, because I want you to see some of the images of the photographers. Uh, I'll show that. And I have a little five minute video, which kind of brings, tells you what the book is like without holding it. And uh, then we'll come back to uh, where we are. Okay, so this is the book, uh, Witness, uh, Kashmir 1986-2016, and nine photographers. So the first of them is Mirajuddin, who is, uh, I won't be too accurate, but almost my contemporary, so we'll leave it there, um, who in many ways invented the genre in Kashmir. Uh, he was, I mean, there have been photographers before, but he was probably the first photojournalist. And this is a very well-known picture uh, from Srinagar, 1993, uh, in the uh, crackdown in Alikadal, it's called. It's a neighborhood in, in Srinagar. Um, it was a picture. Uh, Mehrajuddin used to work for fairly mainstream Indian magazines. So this picture, for example, was reproduced in the uh, Indian news magazine, India Today. This. Uh, picture of the assassination of Justice Nilkant uh, Ganju in uh, Srinagar. Uh, I think this is also uh, 1993. Um, this image from the anti-election campaign uh, in the town of Anantnag uh, in 1989. Uh, those of you who can read uh, Urdu uh, will see that it um, uh, apart from saying, uh, just, just one second, I'm trying to minimize something which refuses to obey. 
Okay. So uh, it says Pakistan Zindabad on top, and down below it says KLF, which is the Kashmir Liberation Front. Uh, so this was a basically uh, a very, uh, uh, it, today it would be called an installation, but it's actually a threat. It's a coffin which says that the first person to vote will be rewarded with this gadi, this car, like you can drive off in this if, if you vote. Um, and this, uh, for me, a very deeply disturbing image uh, from 1995. Uh, in the aftermath of the siege of the shrine of Tsar Sharif, Tsar Sharif is the uh, was is the shrine in memory of uh, Nundurishi Sheikh Nuruddin Wali, who is a very very revered Sufi uh, saint of Kashmir. And in um, 1995, a very almost notorious militant commander called Mast Gul, who was from Pakistan, he got into a standoff with the Indian Army. And eventually, uh, not just this, uh, this uh, 14th century uh, wooden, exquisite wooden shrine burned down, but most of the town also uh, burned down with it. So what you see is looking towards the town. And this image uh, from October 1993 uh, from the town of Bijbihara, um, a few days uh, or perhaps two days after a major massacre where 53 civilians were shot on the street, um, Mirajidin was amongst the first people who reached there afterwards. And as you can see, even the footwear has not been removed. And the light leak that you see on the left of the frame, um, it's very interesting because it comes from this, uh, because the uh, soldier actually snatched his camera and uh, took the film out. And uh, ironically, just, just these two half frames survive. And uh, this is the only sort of visual representation that we have of what was a very, very important uh, massacre. So I'm going to read you something that Mirajirin said to me. And he says, I began to carry two identity cards in two different pockets, one in my shirt and another in my pants. In case something happened, I wanted people to know who they had found. Every day was full of such sights. At one grenade blast, I saw an elderly man rushing around, helping to pick up victims tirelessly until he turned over this one body and realized it was his own son. All of us photographers wept that day. The second photographer in the book is Javed Shah. Uh, for various reasons, I didn't uh, go. I, I'm Kashmiri myself. I forgot to mention that. But for various reasons, between 1989 and 2003, I didn't go back. And in the years uh, just before 2003, one of the things that drew me to Kashmir was Javed's work. He was at that time the principal photographer for the Indian Express in Srinagar and had an extraordinary relationship with his editors uh, in the Express at that time. So Javed's work would always appear on page one, always in color, and it was never direct, you know, the kind of what the photojournalistic image that you would have expected, you know, he did not shoot shootouts and blood, whatever. He shot everything in a very singular kind of way. So this image, for example, which kind of plays very darkly with the trope of the flower-filled shikara on, on Dal Lake. Uh, this image, uh, after a Fedayin attack in Srinagar 2005, um, I used to, in those days, really wonder that w what is this newspaper that allows this kind of photographic image to come as, as photojournalism, you know? Or this uh, dead tourist at the SMHS hospital, April 2006. And this uh, very troubling image of a young Fidayeen uh, dead after an attack at Dalgate in September 2005. Um, he also has this uh, image that I really like about a burial, a burial at Waltingu Nar. Uh, it's actually after an avalanche where more than 50 people were buried in February 2005. So Javed says, like everybody else here, I have several birthdays. Call it intuition, telepathy, whatever. But I do believe in it because that's the only way you can survive this place. Why did I start shooting so many of those distorted reflections those days? Maybe it was to mirror the madness that had taken over our streets, an experiment of sorts, or a sign of my frustration at what was going on. Who can say? The third photographer is Dar Yasin. Uh, Yasin works for the uh, 
Associated Press. He's been with them for a very long time in Srinagar. He is your absolutely, uh, you know, the, the photojournalist as soldier in the sense that he comes every day from home, picks up his gear, goes out, shoots a picture, files it every day, six days a week, you know. And um, he shoots every Friday protest. He shoots every protest. He, if they let him go, he'll go to every gun battle that he can get close to. So he's like, you know, for him, it's like the work he does. But this, but I found when I started looking at his material that there were certain preoccupations in his work. This image from Srinagar, 2016, or this one from 2015, looking for a certain kind of, uh, how shall I say, I don't know how to describe it, but a kind of poetry within the mayhem of what he was encountering. And sometimes deeply human images, such as this of a family who have just walked into their house after a gun battle, uh, where the security forces were using their house as a base and um, have actually ransacked and you know, stolen much that was valuable uh, in Mairu in Srinagar uh, 2010. And this image uh, uh, from Pehlipura, funeral of the militant Wasim Malla 2016. So like this image, for example, was widely carried across international media and someone like Yasin has won every conceivable international award for photojournalism. Um, it's also quite interesting that uh, many of these photographers who I'm going to be introducing you to, they um, are invariably sent off to other uh, hell holes across the world, you know, partially because they're very good at conflict photography, partially because they're Muslim. So they can go to Afghanistan, they can go to Iraq, they can be sent to Bangladesh, they can be, you know, so it's, it's, it's a peculiar kind of CV to have, you know, for, for these guys. So Yasin says to me, I was shooting once near the HMT factory on the outskirts of Srinagar. It was a day-long encounter with militants and the army was keeping us far from the gun battle. When it was over and all of us photographers rushed in, I got busy looking at the bodies, taking pictures, the usual. Suddenly I had the feeling that the place looked oddly familiar and stopped. When I looked around, I realized that the place I was standing in was the burnt out shell of my old school. I was so shaken, I must have stood there for several minutes, my ears ringing, unable to move. The fourth is Javed Dar, who's a close friend. Uh, Javed uh, is uh, from a small village uh, close to the town of Anantnag. Uh, when I first met him in 2003, he was the district photographer for a tiny little Srinagar newspaper called Kashmir Images. He had one of those point and shoot uh, cameras and I, I, I have forgotten, but he, he was either paid a salary of 1500 rupees a month or a per picture rate of 50 rupees or something equally crazy. He's now the uh, photographer for the Chinese news agency uh, Sinhua. Uh, so this image of a press conference by the uh, head of the Dukhtarane Millet, which is a sort of radical women's uh, a Muslim group um, from November 2007. Uh, that's uh, Asiya Andrabi, who leads uh, Dukhtarane Millet. Uh, this image from June 2013, uh, the color comes from the dye that is sometimes sprayed on protesters. Uh, this from Lower Munda Kazigund, a 2008 image of a burial procession. And um, I mentioned that Javed is uh, doesn't live in Srinagar, so uh, he, he goes home on the weekends. He, he, he used to drive on a bike, and now, of course, he has a car. Uh, but he always uh, stops to take pictures of this bunch of, uh, this family or several families of migrant Indian labor who, who work in, in those fields. Uh, they make uh, brooms out of uh, the stuff that is harvested. And he has an amazing set of images of this these families through, through the seasons. So of course the book couldn't accommodate more than one, but this was my own favorite. Uh, uh, I mean, it's unimaginable even for Kashmiris to be able to live through winter in the conditions that these people uh, do. And this image, which has been widely reproduced again um, after the fire in, uh, from Frislan, which is a small village on the outskirts of Pehelgam, 2012. So Javed says to me, I can remember the day the first crackdown happened in our village. I had just finished my metric exam. It was June 9, 1992. 
The army arrived early in the morning and they came in trucks, so we knew this was not going to be routine. We were meant to start planting the paddy that day and had left the house early. The first day of planting is a sort of festival in Kashmir. We were stopped by the soldiers as we walked to the far end of the village and told to go back home. My father tried to argue, but they said no. Boys like him are the terrorists. The fifth is Altaf Kadri. Uh, Altaf also works for uh, Associated Press, although he's now in Delhi. Um, this is an image uh, of, uh, in the aftermath of a grenade attack, uh, 2006. Uh, injured shopkeeper, Srinagar, 2008. And a policeman in the aftermath of a militant attack in Srinagar, 2006. I just want to draw your attention to the hand that you see on the left of the frame. That's actually Altaf's hand. So he's actually helping carry the policeman uh, with one hand and with the other he's taking a big heavy SLR and shooting pictures at the same time. And this is quite shocking for photojournalists, you know, because they never cross the line, right? But for the Kashmiri photojournalists, there is no line because they are shooting amongst their own people, so they can't, they can't and they don't. So even the policeman, he's a Kashmiri policeman for them at the end of the day, you know. He, he might be on the other side, but uh, so I, I just kept it for that. And this from the uh, funeral of a very well-known militant commander called Ruhaullah Bhatt from Avalyura, February 2008. Uh, somehow, um, I mean, all of them have hundreds and hundreds of funeral pictures. You know, that's what you could do a book of funeral pictures. But there's something very heartbreaking for me about the, the, the sheer simplicity and the poverty of, of what the end of someone who, who, when you think of a militant commander, you think of something grander perhaps. But, um, and perhaps that's the draw for people there, you know. And this from Crew, 2005, funeral of three uh, militants. So Altaf says to me, a man had been blown up while diffusing an improvised explosive device in Palhalan village. At least that's what the newspapers in Srinagar had reported. Later that morning, when we photographers got there, the people of the village were so angry, they were ready to lynch us. We ended up being chased through the village for almost 300 meters before a conversation could even be started. You only carry the army version, the furious young men said to us. Whatever they say matters, what we say never gets reported. It usually takes a lot of persuasion by the buzurg, the village elders, to restore the balance. Still, I always like to talk and never give up without arguing for what I believe in. Whether I end up getting slapped up or beaten, no issue, that's part of it. So Altaf um, also has, uh, he has some extraordinary work which he did in Afghanistan actually, where he's done I think four or five tenures. But unfortunately I couldn't include uh, that work in the book. And Shumit Deyal, who um, really is a very, very uh, special and extraordinary person. Shumit's, uh, f uh, it will not be immediately obvious to many of you, uh, from his name Shumit is obviously not a Muslim. He comes from the Pahari region of uh, Rajori, uh, although his parents uh, grew up in Srinagar, so they are also Kashmiri speakers. Shumit um, uh, lived outside of Kashmir, uh, went to school in Nepal, and then ended up miraculously at the International Center for Photography in New York, and became a very, very, what one would call, you know, high-end news photographer. So, in the pecking order of these things, uh, you know, he's shot four covers for Time magazine, including that of Narendra Modi, uh, bless him. Um, um, so, but when he decided to come to Kashmir in 2010, he did something quite interesting. He just put away his digital SLR equipment, bought himself some really eccentric manual uh, Russian cameras, bought a lot of black and white film, and proceeded to work on it. So he would go to the same places that his peer group would go to, but shoot with uh, the, these cameras. So this image from the Hazrat Bal Shrine, Srinagar 2011. This portrait of a woman from Sido 2011. Now the thing is with the manual camera also, when you do a auto rewind, uh, not an auto, uh, you 
rewind it manually and so you know even the double exposures you can never predict what's going to happen it's not like digital where you when you do a manipulation you know exactly what's going to happen so there's a lot of this chancy element and then he started doing these narratives like this one which he uh, calls winter life uh, 2009 2010 but they get really elaborate uh, he's actually shown some of his work where he constructs a kind of story and then shows it not as a print on a wall but on a light table with a loop so it, it's so, such an effective thing because you know, to, to see what's going on, you have to lean forward, you have to concentrate, and it's a really very emotional experience. And then, like all thoughtful people, uh, one day he said, why are we going on taking pictures? So many pictures have already been taken. You know, like, uh, why are we creating more? So he turned to his own family's album. I'm sorry, this is a scale at which you can't really see, but these were family pictures. And so, uh, like on the extreme right is the back of a photograph taken by his grandfather. And he then takes a picture that he's taken and merges it with it. So it says, wish you live long, best wishes, uh, something dayal. Uh, so the image is called Horse and Cemetery 2011. And uh, Shumit says about this picture, we don't know who it was, not about the picture, but about the caption. He says, we don't know who it was meant for, but it has found me. So, this is Shumit saying, I'm not done with my work in Kashmir. I'm not done with all that. When I go back, I'll do something that a large number of people will understand. I need to pull myself back from a level of abstraction and take the work to some other level, he said. In the tales of ghosts who want to be set free, what holds them back is memory, Shumit had written some years ago. There is a certain grip about my childhood memories from Kashmir and a past I must unfold to know who I am. It is here at home that I searched for the experience of being in a space where, and here Shumit Dayal cut himself short and turned to T.S. Eliot. We shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Uh, interestingly, he did go back because he had actually uh, drifted away from photography for a while. He, I don't know, developed some app which was a colossal failure. Uh, but uh, when August 5th happened, he was in uh, LA uh, working with some friends and he just came back and he called me and he said, aren't you going? And I said, no, I can't go. He said, well, I'm going. And he's actually been in and out about 10 times since uh, the August 5th events, which we'll speak about later, and has produced two beautiful videos for the Indian uh, website uh, magazine uh, Caravan, which some of you should look at sometime. So this is Shokat Nanda, he's uh, young. Uh, Shokat is from the town, the North Kashmir town of Baramulla, uh, born there, went to school there, uh, went to college there and uh, then got a scholarship to go to the School of Journalism in Missouri in the US. And uh, interestingly, um, he went to the US, came right back, and went right back home and continues to work out of that same place, Baramulla, where he, um, I don't think most of his pictures, I don't think he ever shoots them more than I don't know, 30 kilometers away from his own house. You know, that's his thing. And I, I really admire that. So this uh, image, uh, Protesting Women, Langate, 2008. Uh, this image uh, of Sakib in Baramulla. Now, this is part of a series, and I'll show you a few, uh, which he did. Um, basically, in Baramulla, there are a whole lot of young boys, really, young men, who... Um, the police is looking for, and so they can't take the risk of being at home in the day. So they have to spend their days hiding in different places. So this is a uh, the wall of a cemetery, uh, and that's Sakib, Baramula 2014. This is Ishfaq, Baramula 2014. Uh, this is a abandoned government dispensary which these boys are in, and Zahin uh, is the same building in Baramula 2014. Um, so uh, this, actually this series was uh, carried by the Washington Post, some in its print version, and I think the whole thing on the website. And later, perhaps at this time, we can talk about the, the, the issues of privacy and how, does, how, does you how do you negotiate that, you know? And this sort of, uh, 
image called Protesta Srinagar 2010, which uh, circulated a lot. And in fact, in the protests that happened uh, all across North America and even in Europe after August 5th, I noticed very often that people had made uh, placards out of this picture, you know. And I thought that's really wonderful when the work of a photographer becomes like a poster, you know. You don't have to actually have a slogan, but you just carry a picture and it tells its, its own story. It's, it's, of course, I'm pretty certain uh, Shocker doesn't know about it because there's no internet since 5th of August. So the text that I'm reading to you is actually just extracted as it is from the book. So the, the tone of it obviously is a bit jagged, but I thought that would be good. At some point during our conversation, we found ourselves stopping in the middle of Cement Bridge. On a December afternoon in 1989, it was the site of a massive public celebration, a spontaneous outburst after five Kashmiri militants were released from prison. The next day, on the back foot and still seething, the police opened fire on an innocuous protest near the bridge. Some thought of it as a targeted killing, a lesson to the boisterous town. One of those killed was a teenager, Parvez, Shokat's cousin. A few months later, in March 1990, Shokat's older brother, Sajjad, quietly slipped away from the house. Only 16 at the time, Sajjad had joined the newly emerged Students Liberation Front and like thousands of other young men in Kashmir who went looking for training and handling arms, he crossed over the line of control to Pakistan-controlled Kashmir. I, I mention this fact because um, it tells you something about how closely imbricated uh, this generation of photographers are with the ebb and flow of uh, life there. So the eighth photographer is Syed Shehriyar. Uh, he's very young. Um, uh, Sharyar, uh, this is a picture from 2016 from Tral, the funeral of Burhan Wani. Burhan Wani was a uh, very sort of charismatic, iconic, very young militant commander, and his killing actually triggered a massive protest that roiled Kashmir for three months and literally brought life to a standstill. Uh, this, a favorite image of mine called Police Announcement. Srinagar 2016, the police are actually making an announcement to say that the uh, polio vaccine in the nearby hospital has not been poisoned, which is that's what people believed. And it's very interesting was the kind of, how shall I say, slightly neurotic edge that daily life has, that even the, even the, the business of distributing polio vaccine uh, becomes uh, something like that. Sharyar is, uh, is a, from the uh, uh, minority Shia community uh, in Kashmir. And a lot of his work, uh, which he does very consciously and very, um, in a very organized sort of way, is documenting Shia life. And um, so uh, th this is a set of pictures that he's taken during Muharram in 2015. This one from uh, Hasanabad, uh, this, uh, the same year from the, at the Langarbagh garden, and uh, this from the Imam Barga at Zedibal, uh, same, 2015. So Sharyar says, till a few years ago, we tried to position ourselves on the side of the protesters. It gave us a very different perspective on their battles with the paramilitary. But that changed completely after 2013. It's become too dangerous for the photographers. Pellet guns are everything for the police now. I don't understand it. They seem to love these pellet guns. It's like a narcotic for them. Sometimes at a protest, they shoot people in the leg, even when the stone throwing is not too heavy, just so that they can identify them later, a sort of tag. And the end of, uh, not the end, but the last of the nine photographers is Azan Shah, who I can only describe as absurdly young. He was not even 20 when the book came out. Uh, he's a very unusual young man, uh, sees himself, uh, I mean, he, he would not be happy with my even describing him as a photojournalist because he's not. He sees himself as a photographer of the city is how he describes it. Uh, this is uh, Fateh Kadal, Srinagar, 2015. And a lot of his pictures are taken during the shutdowns, during the hartals, as they're called. So this series, for example, and he has no names for them. So we had a big uh, 
like struggle on how, how to name his pictures. So ultimately, this one is called Road to Zena Kadal, uh, 2015. Uh, this one, obviously, also Road to Zena Kadal, Srinagar, 2015. Road from Barbar Shah to Habba Kadal, 2016. And this uh, more photojournalistic image taken during a Friday protest uh, in the Bohri Kadal area. But you can see even here uh, what really interests him, you know, and why he's away from the, so to speak, the, the action. And uh, Azan says, you have to accept what is around you and then try and make pictures. That's what I try to do. But you have to start in the morning because things get messy in the day. Would I like to be invisible? Well, I've been taking a lot of pictures on my smartphone recently. It's made me realize the beauty of imperfection in photography. Sharpness is overrated, and I don't like photos that are too sharp or too perfect in terms of dynamic range. Nor do I like photos that are cropped perfectly. Real life and the streets are not perfect. It's the imperfect edges of a photograph that give it realness. So that's the book then, Nine Photographers, Kashmir, 1986-2016, and Witness. So I'm going to just play a short video for you, which might help to understand how these images uh, became a, a, a book. It's made by the designers.
Good. Well, thank you so much, Sanjay. Um, wonderful introduction to to the book. Um, there's so many aspects of the, um, the, the the photographers and their work um, that I'd like to get into the the relationship between um, politics, um, documentation, memory, uh, giving witness. Um, these are all very important themes in in uh, in this book, uh, amongst others. But I think we should really start with your uh, uh, your own story because I think it's a it's an, a very interesting and an important one. Um, we have in the, in amongst these nine photographers eight who are from the majority Sunni uh, community, and then um, there is one. Um, is it Syed, uh, who's yes, uh, Syed Sharia, Syed Sharia, who is from the uh, Shia community? Yeah. But uh, you are yourself um, uh, from the Pandit community, the minority Hindu community, um, who were by and large, um, uh, well, I mean, they they left once the insurgency began um, in in 1990, right? Um, I wonder if, if, if you could just tell us a little bit about your your background and and what led you to filmmaking, and uh, also talk a little bit about the significance uh, of Kashmir right now for for India. And it's a lot, but take your time and uh, <laughs> we'll take it from there. Um, so uh, one of the problems might be that um, because of my own politics, I. I uh, I know. I know. This sounds like I've been smoking something quietly outside, but uh, I find it very difficult to see myself as a Kashmiri pundit. Uh, um, I know I'm not Kashmiri Muslim, but I do see myself as a Kashmiri, um, and I have been uh, accepted as such. I mean, I'm not talking about my childhood, or uh, I mean, my, I uh, I didn't grow up in Kashmir. My father was in the army, so I grew up all over the country. Um, but we had, my grandparents lived there, so it was a place of, you know, summer vacations and nostalgia and grandparents and cousins and so on. Uh, until, like I mentioned earlier, 1989, which was when the insurgency broke out. And then from 89 to 2003, I didn't go at all. And quite honestly, uh, sometimes I ask myself, why didn't I go? And I don't have a clear answer. It's not like I was scared or something terrible had happened or my family had been badly affected or in none of that. It was just some kind of a, you know, a curtain had dropped. And um, I don't want to take too much time here, but I think sometimes you, you, you know, your own uh, political journey prepares you for something, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had been through a series of experiences, political experiences in 2001, 2002, uh, which included, actually, uh, and I think that's important to say here, I, I got involved in the defense of a, a teacher, a, a professor of Arabic in Delhi University called uh, S.A.R. Gilani, who was implicated in the uh, attack on Indian parliament, and he was condemned to death. And I was asked to translate uh, a two-minute, 14-second uh, uh, voice tap, which was the only evidence against him. And when his lawyers came to me, uh, I was a little bit taken away because I said, you know, my Kashmiri is not that good and uh, I don't want to stand up in court and look silly. Um, so they said, yeah, but uh, sort of they mumbled around a bit and then said, actually, we want a Hindu. And I don't know why this shocked me as much as it did, but I was really shocked that, you know, in a case as important as that, it mattered who was going to do the thing. So I said, well, there are lots of Kashmiri Hindu, you know, professors and eminent people in Delhi. You should be asking them. Uh, and then again, there was some mumbling and they said, well, you know, we've asked and they're not prepared to do it. So I think it began a kind of journey for me where I entered mm -hmm. Kashmir through the sewers, if you know what I mean. I mean, I had, it was a place that I knew was a place of nostalgia and charm and so on. But that, and then I became part of the defense committee for uh, Gilani. Uh, so I think it was a kind of a political education. So when I went back in 2003, I, I just saw the whole place very differently. Um, so yeah, so that explains how I uh, got here. And I have to say that uh, in 2003, I began work uh, on a film which I finished in 2007. 
Um, since then, I have done other kinds of work, but quite honestly, uh, I cannot get my head out of there. Uh, so if I do other things, it's because I have to or something comes up, but I again keep going back. Uh, so somehow telling that story uh, is something um, I, I, I'm not able to fully understand it myself. But uh, so I did the film. I actually brought out an anthology of writing, uh, uh, which is called Until My Freedom Has Come. And they, so they're all for me, they're all connected because one came out of the other. I do some other writing also, but they're just different ways for me of uh, producing an engagement with uh, what's going on in Kashmir. Uh, the larger question of what's the significance of Kashmir um, I often think of this because, um, you know, uh, I think I mentioned this yesterday at the screening I did of Jashnir at uh, uh, UBC that, um, you know, it's a very tiny place and um, they are fighting a struggle against a very, very powerful country. India is a very powerful country. So how is it that we have been able to produce uh, an energy that allows me to sit here today and have all of you in this room, you know, that's quite an achievement, you know, like, uh, and after 30 years of, uh, so we, we can come back to it at the end, but there is a, and I'm not saying this because I'm a Kashmiri. I think that Kashmir has historically and even sort of almost prehistorically had an, had a, a place, uh, in the imagination of South Asia, you know? Uh, and, you know, you can look at Sanskrit texts from the sixth century and uh, Kashmir figures as a kind of heaven-like place. Yeah. So it's not just the BJP who are transfixed with it, you know? Uh, it's, right. a, it's, it's, a, it's an old uh, kind of uh, yeah. thing. We can come back to it, but... Yeah, well, I, I remember, you know, sitting around the, the dining table with my parents and they would, uh, speak about uh, Kashmir uh, in incredibly evocative uh, terms, uh, though they had never visited. Um, there was this kind of fantasy uh, and a mythology, which was also aided in a way by um, uh, by Nehru. Um, yes. Nehru really um, celebrated the fact that he came from the yes. Kashmiri pundits, and um, yeah. this became part of his his own uh, personal um, mythology. Now, of course. Um, in the BJP's project of constructing um, an authoritarian populist form of politics, they require, because of the internally divided nature of the imagined Hindu community, um, they require a particularly sharp definition of the enemy who has become, as we know, uh, the, um, uh, the Muslim other. And Kashmir, it seems, would function as both the kind of enemy from within and the enemy yes. from without yes. in terms of its connection with, with Pakistan. So um, it has this incredibly charged um, significance in the region, of course. Um, what really fascinated me about the book is the way it frames um, photojournalism um, as pushing the, the medium itself in a, in a radically different direction. So the insurgency itself actually um, uh, determines where the, the medium can go, it seems, from within yeah. that context. I mean, the, the, the book presents the shift from a kind of uh, spectacular um, presentation of Kashmir as, as paradise, where it's, it's a kind of heaven, right? The kind of thing that you know, my mother would have evoked, my parents would have evoked, to a place where people actually live and where social struggles and political struggles, hopes and dreams, uh, in a sense, come, come alive. And I, I thought that was really um, incredibly uh, um, evocative. It, it really helps us to understand the, the work. But I also thought there was a, an interesting um, uh, a kind of resonance in the Canadian context. Uh, as, as we were discussing over lunch, um, one of the most celebrated artistic movements in Canada is, of course, the Group of Seven. And the Group of Seven is known for this kind of modernist depiction of the landscape. Um, and formally, it's, it's um, 
it's quite good. I mean, I'm not a huge fan, uh, but people are. Um, but one of the things that's notable about the group of seven is that, for the most part, people are not there. The in, in, inhabitants of the land, the indigenous people, are erased. Um, and so you have a similar sort of thing happening in these kind of uh, colonial and tourist industry type depictions of Kashmir. It's, it's a beautiful landscape, but the people are in a sense uh, sim symbolically disappeared, which then in a way augurs, portends a, a, a very dark future, which in a sense comes to be. You have, was it, I think, 80,000 people who, yes. who are disappeared since the uh, uh, beginning um, of uh, the uprising. Uh, and the Indian authorities say, yes, people have disappeared, but they've in fact just gone over the line of control. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I'm wondering if you, if you could talk a bit about that. But yeah. also, um, there's also another kind of, one could say, disappearance insofar as um, all of the photographers um, are male. I'm wondering if you could huh. also yeah. talk yeah. about, about so, that. Um, you just have to jog my memory if I uh, leave out any. I just want to read uh, something to you which uh, I think sets the tone. Um, it's, a, uh, it's an idea that I first encountered when I was working on my film. Um, it's the word Shahid in, in Persian and in Arabic. Uh, um, sorry, you want the mic to be closer? Okay. So. Um, it's uh, shahid, shahid, the, this word which is, uh, which is the word for witness in Arabic, Persian, and Urdu. In the Quran, shahid occurs frequently in the sense of witness and once as martyr. It's very interesting because most people think shahid means martyr, you know, but mostly it's as witness. But the Greek word martis, the person bearing witness, gives rise in the New Testament to the word martyr. It's very interesting that across yeah. civilizations and cultures, this now I won't know. I don't know if it's an ambiguity, but this kind of space between witness and martyr. And I think, for me, um, I think it perhaps it's what I think I became as a witness. But I think that's what all the young men in this book also, in a sense, well, suffer from. I mean, I remember when I, in 2003, made friends in Srinagar. Uh, most of them were younger than me. Uh, uh, I, I would discover that they had never been to the Mughal gardens, you know. They had not been to Nishat or they had not been to Shalimar. And this was shocking for me because my childhood was all about picnics. Uh, and I realized it's because it was like a form of protest, you know, like your mates died fighting, you know. You're not going to go to some garden mm. because it's spring. So there was this kind of almost cussed uh, refusal to almost engage with the beauty, which is the over... I mean, in, uh, what can I say to you? Like, it, it, Kashmir has this extraordinary light, you know. You go anywhere in about 20 minutes, your head is reeling with beauty in that sense, you know. But they would not engage with it, you know. Or most of the guys I became friends with wouldn't. And so it was, uh, I mean, they were, you know, they're not, they're not terribly cerebral people and uh, they're not going to theorize about what they do. But um, they do see themselves as performing a role and a duty. You know, like we have to be there. Of course, they're competitive and of course they want to, uh, you know, make money and get their picture into Time magazine and buy that new jacket and the new car. Of course, they do all that. But... At the edge, they also see themselves as performing what they see as a duty, you know. And I think that's very uh, central to uh, the work that all of them do. There's no argument about that, you know, what, what it represents to them. It's not a, uh, you know, it's not some... Uh, so their work very often, um, you know, I once asked Yasin, who, who's such a great photographer, I said, you know, so often they go to places where there are six photographers, right? So pretty much all of them uh, end up taking the picture of the same thing. You know, it could be a, a house in which a militant was hiding and now it's been brought down, whatever. So I said, so how does it feel? I said, I would feel terrible as a filmmaker. I, I don't want to be where there are other filmmakers, you know, with a camera. 
So he said, but I'm not taking a picture of that thing because I want to. I'm taking a picture of the thing because I have to, you know. And then once I get there, I have to do the best job of it, you know. It's not, you know, it's, it's a very interesting thing, you know, because we think of photography as being so driven by ego, you know, like uh, I am the artist and I am going to take this great picture, but it's not like that uh, for them. Um, the second question uh, about the absence of women. So uh, when I was um, looking for images for this book and meeting people, um, which would have been mostly in, in 2016, um, there were no, um, uh, no women photojournalists around. And uh, there were a few people whose work I saw, but you know, it wasn't uh, strong enough to uh, sort of sustain a chapter. And although one wrestled with that question for a while, so for example, say someone like Shumit Deyal, who's the only non-Muslim in the book. I mean, he's not there, you know, because he's a non-Muslim. He's there because I think he's an extraordinary photographer and he's an extraordinary influence on the other photographers, which is also significant. Um, but a very interesting thing happened, which is that when the book came out, we had this public sort of event in Delhi and the, the, uh, all the photographers were there. It was a wonderful, uh, event that they were they're so utterly charming all of them that they had their audience eating out of their hands but at the very end some, uh, somebody and she's actually a friend of mine she raised this uh, her hand and she said great book great project but why are there no women so I uh, rather deftly turned it over to the photographers and I said you answer this question <laughs> and they all answered it very badly uh, you know, they said things like, yeah, yeah, women should uh, take pictures of the home and hearth and, you know, like, sort of they dug their graves in uh, e deeper and deeper. Uh, so I, as you can see, I, I elided by not answering the question. But that night, I got several messages on Facebook from young Kashmiri women, some of them photographers, some of them aspiring photographers, saying, that was great, the book is great, but you've got to, like, we've got to do something about getting women to participate. And so we eventually I met up with a bunch of them in 2017. And anyway, it took a long time for us to get our act together because we wanted to find, uh, so the idea was to do a workshop. And then in February this year, we did the first workshop, which we called the Witness uh, workshop and uh, I very carefully found these seven women who whose work I had been following on Instagram and so on and we found a very very empathetic and unusual um, photographer from Delhi uh, Tanvi Mishra who's the uh, creative director of uh, the caravan magazine and she's both a photographer and a curator so it was such an amazing experience you know I just set it up and I thought I would kind of check in in the morning and see that all the food was organized and the place was warm and then I would go away. But I ended up spending all my time there. And um, at least two of them, if, if this book was being put together today, I think at least two of those women would be in this book, you know. Uh, it's just very quickly they've found a language. And what is really interesting about them actually is that, uh, and Tanvi had long conversations and I had long conversations with them, they don't want to, they want to shoot the other thing, whatever that other thing is, but they want to be on the front line. So they have to be at the Friday protest. They, you know, like it's almost, so we kept telling them, you know, there are other things to take pictures of. Like you don't have to be, you know, in the middle of the tear gas and the whatever, but they said, no, we have to be. And that's, I think, quite uh, quite amazing as as well. Yeah, yeah. because you we were describing in your uh, um, sort of presentation, the kind of danger that photojournalists do face. I mean, the, being chased for, for 300 meters before things can calm down and you can actually have a conversation. But one can understand uh, this. Um, I think maybe despite this, or perhaps because of it, you, you have a, an incredible uh, range of uh, amazingly compelling. This is a body of work that's, that's phenomenal. Um, I, you, when we were talking earlier, you were kind of downplaying maybe the aesthetic dimension, the formal dimensions, but I, I think, you know, in particular, um, Javed Shah's work, yes. and you know, these two photos really impressed me. Soldier on the Street, yes. uh, which I still can't understand how, how that works. On. Yeah, exactly. And then voters line up, the composition yes. um, is, is phenomenal. It almost looks staged. 
Yeah. Right. And I, I want to come back to that because this is, this is something that's very important for um, having this discussion about this theme here in Vancouver. Yeah. So I'll come back to, to that um, in a second. But one of the, the other themes that struck me that's really quite fascinating is the relationship between, so your, your two main um, uh, key words, let's say, are, are witness and, um, and memory, yes. right? And it seems there's a connection between those two things and the, you know, the, the experience of, of living through a time of, of kauf or fear, yes. right? Yes. Yes. So there's this idea of trauma, yes. forgetting, um, the uh, going invisible, you know, the invisibilization of, yeah. uh, of Kashmir and Kashmiris. Uh, I'm wondering if these are themes you'd, you'd like to just take up and, and talk yeah. about. The, the visibility question is fascinating from any number of angles. I was just reading a piece from the New York Times, I think, a couple of days ago, where they're even now running out of candles. So yeah. the, the, the power has been, been, been shut off, the, the, the lighting's sparse, and now they're running out of candles. So th there's a sense of a kind of darkening uh, of, uh, of, of Kashmir. But there's also, um, at the same time, uh, an attack on, on vision itself. Right. Um, what we're seeing in in Chile, with protesters being uh, uh, having their eyes uh, attacked by the police, this is something that you, you saw in and see yes. in in Kashmir, especially young people. Yeah. The pellet, you know, that one image of the, of the young man whose eyes are reddened and his face is just riddled with with pellets. Um, this is a strategy. It's, so it's not just shooting them in the leg, but t targeting their vision. I'm wondering if you could talk yeah. about that. Yeah. So Saeed Chahriar, who uh, I use that quote from where he talks about the, you know, tagging on his leg uh, from the pellet guns. Um, actually, I have a, uh, a conversation with him where he talks about an incident when he and another uh, photographer were standing and this police uh, vehicle came with this, you know, they have this way in which they can stand up on top. And he just suddenly got a sense that this guy on top is going to fire at us, you know, and Sheryar just took one step away and he says, I could hear the clatter of the pellets hitting the shop front, the closed shop front. And the other photographer, Zuhib, he actually lost an eye. You know, he, I mean, permanently he's lost an eye. Otherwise he was down for a long time. And I know that Sheryar so told me, I'm not taking pictures like for a while. I, I don't want, you know, I, I just can't bear the idea that. Uh, and this year, I mean, these are guys, you know, who've shot in really extraordinary, horrendous circumstances. But when August 5th happened, uh, and of course there were difficulties in getting images out and so on, but I just noticed that... Could, could you mention what August 5th Oh, so August 5th is when the government of India abrogated uh, uh, the Kashmir special status and the 100-day lockdown that we referred to in the beginning began then. So it's a, let's say, even in a place uh, full of crises, it's a crisis of unbelievable proportions. So uh, I started noticing that the pictures were not up to what I knew these guys are capable of, you know, and I, I was saying like, they're not even going that far from their what is called press colony. So what's up, you know? And then for some reason in the middle of August, I had to go myself because my parents were in Srinagar and I had to get them out because, uh, you know, it was getting very <clears throat> worrying. So I met them and I said, what's up? And they said, We've heard that they are targeting photographers because they don't want images to get out. So we can't take the risk. And fortunately, many of them work for big agencies. The agencies back them up. They said, look, you know, we are here for in the long game. So, you know, don't risk it. Take a picture only when, you know, when you can. And um, so in that sense, um, what we've entered into now in Kashmir, um, anybody who is outside of the curfew, anybody who's on the street, is very vulnerable. So it's ironic that uh, some of the best pictures that came out of this period, uh, many of them were carried in the New York Times by a Bombay-based photographer. He's an Indian guy. So he has a certain immunity. But these guys, the Kashmiri photographers, are known to the cops. The cops know who this guy is. They know where he lives. So they can send a message to you saying, you know what, maybe you shouldn't be on the street. And then are you going to take that chance? So although they now go out with these, they 
all kinds of body armor and so on but ultimately you're a photographer you know you have to lift your visor and you have to put the camera to your eye you're, you're not going to be able to do it from inside a mask of any kind so the uh, i think that the stuff that altaf and all talk about you know getting beaten up by people and all that that's like child's play now you know because they're really under uh, faced with something much more macabre and uh, something very very violent you know yeah, yeah yeah well i mean i think the book um really uh in a in a subtle way, but in a in a clear way, it really poses the question of the relationship between politics and aesthetics. Insofar as um, aesthetics, according to you know one uh, theorist anyway, and this is Jacques Ranciere, says that it, it really is about um, the what he calls the distribution of the sensible. So what we what we can perceive and what we are, are unable to perceive, what we hear, what remains uh, unheard, what, and of course what is visible and what remains. Um, invisible, and I think that just the, the 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 initial framing that I referred to earlier, in terms of a kind of tourist or kind of colonial uh, representation of Kashmir, to one now where you actually see political agency. You see yes. um, uh, the people who live in Kashmir, Kashmiris actually um, exercising their uh, their agency on the street. Um, uh, this is the essence, in a sense, of where politics and aesthetics yes. uh, meet. So I think it's you know, r really fascinating. I think at the same time, however, it might pose some, uh, some problems, and, and this is how I would put it. I mean, uh, it connects up with your, your points just about the targeting of, um, uh, of the press. I mean, we've seen this authoritarian populists do this now um, uh, as a, um, just a, a matter of course. But it's something the Nazis did uh, very uh, systematically. Right? The idea of the, the Lügen Presse, the, the lying press that had to be yeah. uh, put in its place in silence. This is something we see coming out of um, uh, the White House today. See it in, in uh, com coming from New Delhi as well and um, Hungary and, you know, from Viktor Orban and so on. And so, on the one hand, it seems that photojournalism is being attacked from this angle, and it can be attacked on the basis of its pseudo-documentary quality, right? Yeah. It looks like facts. It looks like the way it, it is. But in fact, it, it isn't. It's been it's been doctored, the, the, the photography has been presented in a particular way for particular political ends. But on the other side, this is exactly something that, that artists have been exploring for the last 30, 40 years. I mean, right now, there's a Cindy Sherman exhibition. This is something she, she has really been quite an innovator in doing. But of course, Vancouver itself, and we were talking about this a, a, a little bit over lunch, um, Vancouver is known for uh, photo conceptualism. So really breaking down uh, the barriers or breaking down the, the borders between photography, mm. filmmaking, and painting. Yes. So you see the artifice of yeah. photography. You see this most clearly, I think, in, in Jeff Wall's work. I'm, I'm wondering if combined with the democratization yeah. uh, of photography through these things. I mean, and this was the the, the, the last photographer you you mentioned. Azan. Azan. Sure. Yeah, w was really celebrating this. Yeah. Right? But it does create some pitfalls and some real dangers. So yeah. I'm wondering if you could reflect a bit on that. So I think um, I think that there's no doubt that over this period, the uh, with the I don't know if we should use the word democratization, but the proliferation of photography has meant that. Many more images are available. Many more people are taking images. So when someone like Mirajuddin was taking pictures, that image which some of you will recall um, uh, of that family under a crackdown in Ali Kadal, you know, with a bunch of soldiers and whatever. Now, uh, I don't know why, but I just said to him once, I said, um, uh, do you know where this is? And he said, yeah, I can take you there. So I said, OK. So I went in down to a store and got a couple of big prints made. And I said, OK, let's go. So we drove down to that area and you know he his son and i were like walking down the streets now in kashmir if you walk down the streets carrying a photographic print in your hand you could be anywhere you know you could be the cops you could be the spooks you could be you could be militants you know whatever so people were a little bit careful but within 
minutes literally we went to a shop and he said oh this this is go down that alley and this is that guy's house and so this is now after 30 years right yeah he's trying to find the place and then one guy came along and he said oh this is Merajuddin's picture so I said yeah that's Merajuddin he said oh really he's like you've grown old he said I know uh, this came out in India today so now just think of the extraordinary power that somebody in downtown Srinagar remembered because at that time it was extremely significant for him yeah. that that picture had come out in of India course. today. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, fast forward to 2019 and with the, uh, you know, the clamp down and the inability of photographers to move out and videographers to move out, the government was putting out a spin that all is well, there are no protests, nobody's doing anything until uh, a young uh, freelancer for the BBC um, shot some video of a protest. And it's actually a very disturbing image because it's shot from quite far away from a window. It's a street and all the young men are facing towards one side and you don't know what they're facing because the cameraman is not uh, exposing himself to risk. The young men are. And on the soundtrack, all you hear is automatic fire. You know, It's like crackle. And these guys are ducking and, you know, falling and getting up again and throwing stones. And so promptly the government said, oh, this is doctored footage. This is not from now. This is from Pakistan. This is from five years ago, whatever, the usual thing. And the Indian news media, which is a completely sold out, uh, the, I'm talking about the corporate media, they just said, look at this, Pakistan-sponsored, uh, you know, uh, staff and blah, 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 and kind of went to town with it. And the BBC were being humiliated, you know, because the government was really... And then, and this I heard off the record from somebody in the BBC, the BBC said, fine, then we are going to put the unedited footage on the internet, and then we'll decide whether it's fake or not. <laughs> and the government promptly shut the whatever up and actually made a statement saying, no, no, actually, it's not, it's not totally fake, it's somewhat fake, and whatever, whatever, <laughs> you know. But meanwhile, they had muddied the water, because everybody who wanted to could say, but isn't there a lot of fake? You know, I was interviewed by people who said, what do you have to say about fake news? And I said, what fake news? Uh, oh, you know that uh, BBC, yeah, yeah, we know it's actually not fake, but what do you think about fake news, you know? It's like it, it gives you a toe hold to start, you know, the water is muddied. You've, you've tossed the ink into the, yeah. the water, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Well, good. I'm, there's so many more questions that I'd like to ask, but I, I think I'm going to stop now so we can... So there's one um, thing I want to point out, it because up. it's a neglected part of the book, which I, um, is so deep, uh, so, so uh, I'm so close to it that I always want to talk about it. So uh, you would have noticed that in the back of the book, uh, there are these yellow pages, you know, which is a kind of index of the book. Uh, I, I have it there as well. And um, it arranges all the photographs chronologically, not by photograph. And what we did when we, when we arranged it was we found that there were certain words that reappeared through the book, in the text, in the captions. Uh, so what were those words? They were massacre, there were counterinsurgency, there was martyr's graveyard, there was paramilitary, there was Kashmiri Pandit, there was stone throwing. So eventually there were 15 words. So what we did was, I've written these kind of, you know, half page notes on 15 words. And quite honestly, I, uh, uh, in some burst of vanity, think that if you read those 15 words, you'd actually get a pretty good idea of what was going on in Kashmir, you know. It's and very helpful, very helpful. And they're all yeah. cross-referenced, you know. So if you see a picture and you see paramilitary, it also tells you where all paramilitary figures in the book. So it's a kind of hyperlinked <laughs> book, but not in, uh, on, on the web, but uh, in, in a book. So I just thought I should boast a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Well, now we'll open it up for questions and or comments. <laughs> I'm looking forward to part two of a book uh, highlighting those women that you talked about um, because I'd like to see a more, I mean, it was a great book, perfect. <laughs> um, gave me an insight into Kashmir, but I see a lot of conflict. I see a lot of blood. I see a lot of death. And, you know, I'm a photo-based artist. I studied at Emily Carr. 
I have a major in photography. It would be nice to see a um, sequel to that book sure. that has the women photographers. I could say a lot about it, but yeah. I won't. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that, and I'm hoping that, you know, maybe um, I'm not familiar with your organizations and how things work. It's the first time I've heard of the sponsoring organization. But, um, you know, just want to put that out because you seem like a mover and shaker. That's what I'd like Me? to see. Yeah, I'm and also, so. <laughs> well, because you were talking about that you met with those women, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's, I'm just putting that out yeah. that I'd like to see that. I'll be looking forward to it. Sure. And I'll keep my eyes open. Thank you Because so I think, I'd like to know what the women and children and people who are living under those circumstances are doing daily when those shots are taken. So what's visible and what's not visible? You talked about it. And I'd like to see more of what's not been visible. Very good. So. so maybe we take three yeah, at a time. Sure. So the next. Anybody? If you wouldn't mind just passing it over. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Hi. Thanks so much for coming. Uh, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on what will happen after the 100 days, after August 5th, because I think I heard you say the Modi government said it would be a 100 day. No, no, no. 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 So I'll just quickly explain that. Uh, on the 5th of August, uh, the government of India abrogated uh, this thing uh, called uh, Article 370 and Article 35A, which were the legal and constitutional links by which Kashmir's relationship with India was governed. So in effect, it was a legal and constitutional annexation of Kashmir. Now, having said that, the, the, the Article 370 and 35A was merely a fig leaf. In a say, you know, Kashmir has already been annexed by India, but there was a kind of, uh, you know, like a, uh, let's say, a mutually agreed upon posturing that there is a certain amount of autonomy. So, for example, over the uh, state uh, secretariat, Kashmir flies, in addition to the Indian flag, it flies its own flag, and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, this was preceded by a kind of militarization which is extraordinary even by the standards of Kashmir. So where we were consistently, we're talking about half a million soldiers uh, on the eve of August 5th and in the first few weeks, uh, uh, 130,000 more soldiers were brought in. So you, you can't possibly, I don't know if there, there's any more place to place soldiers in, in Kashmir you know, right now. So. This was also preceded by massive arrests. So literally, anybody from any political formation, including pro-India formations, what, what were traditionally you know, political parties like the National Conference or the PDP or the Congress, who are considered pro-India in Kashmir, even they were uh, locked up. Cadres of the jamaat e islami 1,200 people arrested. So I think even before August 5th, like something like Four to five thousand people were arrested, and now the estimates are out of control. You know, somebody saying ten, somebody saying fifteen, because they are not proper arrests. You see, they're just detentions. So, fourteen-year-old kids picked up, locked up, uh, held for five days, released, told to come back in three days. So, in effect, you could say something like fifteen to twenty thousand uh, people are currently in various forms of detention. So why, why I mentioned this is because, uh, in fact, I heard apocryphally somebody say that the instructions to the police were that anybody who walks through the, the gully, the lane, and to whom more than five people do dua salam, which is a salutation, pick him up. You understand? Because it's not just that he's a political activist or whatever, that if he's a well-known guy in his neighborhood, take him in. Or, you know. So um, people were obviously stunned. You know, because it's in times of crises that you need political actors. Now, if every political actor has already been taken in, who do you talk to? How do you respond? So this siege is a very peculiar animal. It's partly, in, um, partly imposed by the state, and partly now it's turned into a resistance. So the state has made several attempts to op reopen schools, but kids are not going. People are not sending their kids. Shops do not, you know, so what I mean, it's a, it's a, the communications thing is, of course, state imposed because they're very fearful of that. They think that somehow they think that if communication starts, then people will run riot. So actually what began as a siege has turned into a very 
strange kind of political tactic. And we don't know how it's going to end. It's already 103 days, you know, winter's around the corner. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I do feel that uh, people have managed to, through this kind of unusual tactic, draw extraordinary attention. So I don't think that the US Congress would have had two, you know, congressional hearings if this had not happened. So you, you know what I'm saying? It's a, I don't think anybody thought of it as a political tactic, but on the ground, that's what I see it as, as emerging. So it's an ongoing siege, which we don't know who's imposed the siege and whether it's a protest or it's a siege, but it's a standoff. And, you know, it's, it's okay for people who are middle class or have money in the bank. Uh, shops open every morning, the, 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 morning uh, the early morning namaz, which is the Fajr namaz. So shops open at that time and by 8.39 they close. So people go buy uh, food, whatever they need. But what about daily wage labor, you know, people who uh, drive taxis, drive buses. Uh, how are they going to earn? How are they going to eat? But there is obviously some quiet infrastructure operating through the mosque, people helping each other out quietly, not drawing attention. Uh, you know, we talked about the 2014 flood uh, at lunch, and I was telling him that in many ways, the absolutely unspeakably uh, unfair way in which the Indian state dealt with Kashmir during the 2014 floods was a kind of training for this. You know, people learned how to, look, sink or swim, we have to do this together. You know, we're not getting help from our government. So these mechanisms, I'm actually, I, I'm obsessed with that flood, so I keep uh, kind of reading around it. And it's amazing, like, the kind of networks that people created in order to help themselves. So that's what's going on on the ground. Thank you. Yeah. I guess we just take them one at a time. It's fine as well. <laughs> oh, sorry, we had said three. No, that's fine. We can just do it this way. We have lots of time. I have a very short buffer, so I, I'm afraid that I lose the... Yeah, yeah, uh, no, Yeah, I'd like for you to comment on a, a weirdness that I, I really have a hard time getting my head around um, with respect to both the manifest danger of a project like this and the manifest existence of it. Uh, um, contrasting the situation in Kashmir to the rest of India, which is, in the present moment, one of the more dangerous places on earth to be a um, progressive journalist or blogger or, or uh, even street photographer. Um, and and this, this weirdness that creates both the danger and the possibility for a project like yours in Kashmir is this odd situation where the, it, it seems that the uh, authority of the state is expressed through uh, the police force and the military. Um, but the really pervasive and dangerous reach of cadre politics, which is, which is such a um, tremendously violent and dangerous aspect of uh, the current state doesn't really seem to, uh, I mean, it's not really in play there. Uh, so on the, on the one hand, um, it's more dangerous than any place for these, these, these people because they're dealing um, with a militarized force. And yet in the bizarre context that is modern India, in Kashmir there's kind of an immunity from this absolute, uh, um, horrifically dangerous undercurrent of violence that comes from cadre politics. I, that's, a, that's an excellent point, actually, because um, in so many ways, these guys are at the end of it on home territory. Yeah. That's what allows Altaf Kadri to reach out and help the cop as well, you know. They are always, ultimately, they are protected by people. You know, they know that, okay, I'll get slapped. But that's what it's going to, it's going to be, you know. Um, so uh, this, uh, this is a longer conversation. I mean, like, for example, you know, I've, 
uh, quite a lot of the work that I've done has been done with what we call social movements in India, you know, a struggle against a dam. And I've been in situations which when you look at the footage, you might imagine that, oh my God, this looks dangerous. But actually, I'm so protected because I'm in the middle of the crowd and they know that he's, they don't have to know, I don't have to wear a badge, they don't even have to have seen my face, but they know he's, he's with us, you know. So, um, yesterday the film I, I showed at UBC has a sequence of a funeral of a militant commander. And actually, I don't shoot myself, I work with the cinematographer. And that day my cinematographer was leaving and, and we got news that there's this funeral and we could go to it. And at that time, uh, people didn't allow uh, videographers at funerals because it's a kind of surveillance, you know, like who's going to show up, who's going to be shouting the slogans. But we had some in, so I went. So I go to this village and there are like seven, eight thousand people there. Crazy emotional kind of whatever. And I just took my camera and waded in. Okay? I don't have anybody watching my back. I don't have a sound recorder. I have nothing. I just, I'm, and you know, I'm wearing my headset so that I can hear the sound vaguely. And I must have shot there for an hour and a half. I walked right to the heart of the crowd where the body was being prepared. People made place for me. I retreated. So there is this peculiar thing that sometimes uh, your identification, and they must have thought that, okay, if he's here, because I was the only videographer there, then he must be okay, you know. Uh, that's the only other explanation for it. So I think that uh, this is a, and you're absolutely right, that I would be terrified of taking that camera and going into a Bajrang Dal rally, for example, you know, because I would, if they figured there's something wrong here, I would get lynched or beaten yeah. up. I wouldn't just get slapped around, you know. Yeah. So it is true that uh, those of us who work sort of in tandem or whatever, and it's tacit, you know, it's not that, it's not that you go and say, guys, I'm on your side and, you know, will you look after me. No, it's not that. I don't know what it is. It's the body language. It's, it's something which, which gets going and then people will just let you in. Mm. And um, yeah. I should just mention, uh, and you remember this, I think you were there. Um, we organized about two years ago with Sunset and Hari Sharma. Um, <coughs> Dion Bancha was part of that. It was um, a panel on uh, the assassination of Gary Lankesh yes. and, and it exemplifies exactly, yeah, I think, your point. Um, and so, there's a question. Yes, India. Could you, could you pass up? Yeah. Sure. Just keep it circulating. I don't need. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I haven't uh, gone through your book, but I, I did learn a lot today. And what resonates for me um, this week, they've also had artists from Berlin in commemorating um, 30 years of uh, the removal of the wall. And the narratives when the Stasi were there and some of the bloodshed and after, um, some people have said in the archive that um, they can still feel the wall, even though it wasn't there. What resonates in your comment when you said you were shocked that it was your school? And so I'm thinking about the politics of these images now. And, um, and what I, where I'm coming from is the erasure of identity. Now India has taken away the Kashmiri flag, which, um, you know, is the heart of the Kashmiri identity. These images you have will rupture, um, I think, the identity of many who no longer see the mosques, who no longer see those places where the Kashmiri flag is, is raised. So where do you see the value of this now? because there are ubiquitous tensions, and um, you'll have to think about this book in 10 years. So, um, I, I'm going to have to approach what you're saying slightly elliptically. Um, see, part of the intention of this book was to slow down uh, something that moves very fast, which is photojournalism. You know, picture appears, great picture, you know, wow, nice, image and then it's gone, you know? And you don't even remember. If Yasin is a great photographer, maybe he is, but like, where is his work? You know, like it's gone, you know? Uh, even if you work for AP and it's there on the website and so on and so forth. So for me, the big uh, lure was that 
if we slow down the work of these guys and hold it together, is there some larger meaning that comes out of it? You know, and I think the answer is yes, th there is. You know, it was obvious to me that it works. Um, your first comment about the erasure of identity, actually my argument is that um, a Kashmiri identity has gotten even sharper after what I the mean, government. The Indian state is trying to. Yeah, but you know what I mean. Sometimes, like some, that's what I said. There was a kind of hypocritical relationship between India and Kashmir, which was exemplified in the existence of the flag in Article 370. When you take that away, then people say, "Okay, the crap is out." You know, now it's a real tussle. Now let's deal with it. And the, uh, the, the fact that the, the so-called middle ground, you know, uh, is gone, you know. So I have no doubt that in every which way, uh, even the elite who traditionally in Kashmir have been pro-India because they are afraid of the chaos that the other position might carry, even the elite this time are coming out on the streets or speaking up. You know, I, I have aunts who are, I can't have a civil conversation with them because of their politics. But I've had them say to me with a deep sigh saying, anyway, India is going to have to pay for it. And I'm saying, India? Like, I haven't heard this from you before, you know? And pay for it, you know? So there's a huge shift that uh, in some senses, if I were within the deep resistance, which I'm not, uh, I would be really grateful to the Modi government because it has pulled together the Kashmiri resistance with a kind of incandescent fury. You know, it doesn't matter how middle class you are, how much of a vested interest you are, how much property you own in Delhi, people are <laughs> hopping mad. You know, you've seen that in North America. I think that the, the Kashmiri diaspora in North America, uh, which might have had a more engaged early period in the 90s, but it has been a very, very politically conservative uh, force. I know that through experience, you know, like I would show my film and there would be uh, 69 Canadians in uh, Toronto and the only Kashmiri was me, you know. Uh, they wouldn't come out because they didn't want to be seen in places like this. But what they have done post August 5th is spectacular, you know. So I think that uh, whoever made these calculations on the part of the government of India uh, made a very bad uh, calculation. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So I guess this follows. Um, my question is, there has not been a return of the Hindu pundits into yes. the region. Yes. And could you talk a little bit about where those people who were kicked out at one yeah. point, um, what their status is, whether there's any desire to return? So uh, this is going to be a complicated answer and uh, presumes a certain amount of familiarity with South Asia, but I'll just sort of try to be as... Uh, so um, a couple of things. One is, uh, let me begin with a story. Uh, when I was putting this book together, uh, one day I just said to myself, I must have a picture of the Pandit migration, you know? So I went to Merajuddin and I said, MD, how come you don't have a picture? You haven't shown me a picture of the migration. So he looked very befuddled for some reason. Like, and he said, uh, because they left at night. So I said, like, 200,000 people, like how many nights? Uh, and by the fifth night, surely as a well-informed photojournalist, you ought to have known. And he was genuinely puzzled. He didn't have an answer. He was not being dodgy. And he said, no, let me ask some of my pals, you know, my older pals. So next time I met him, he had got those guys in and they were equally confused, okay? They said, yeah, yeah, they used to leave at night and uh, that's why we don't have pictures. Um, Ultimately, one of the younger photographers took me aside and said, let me tell you why they don't have pictures. Because he said, I was a fifth, that was Javed Dar, one of the photographers. He said, I was a 15 year old and I saw my Kashmiri Pandit neighbors at the bus stop in Anantnag. And I said, hey, auntie, where are you going? And they said, you know, things are so bad. We're getting out to Jammu for a while and we'll come back. 
She said, that's how they left. You understand? Now, why am I telling you this long-winded anecdote? Kashmiri Pandits left Kashmir, right? They left in fear and anxiety. Some people were killed. Some people lost their lives. Um, but it wasn't the way it has been described. It was not like the partition of India. It's not like, you know, 100 trucks carrying Kashmiri Pandits went out in the dead of the night. But that is the way it has been constructed. And to a point where there was a time when I, uh, early days of those e-groups and all that, whenever I used to, I was on several of the Kashmiri Pandit e-groups. Wherever I used to read somebody describe those days, I used to write a personal email and said, listen, I'm interested in this period. Can I come and talk to you? Because I, I want to know what happened. I never got a reply. Hmm. Because I'm not saying that they were not telling, not that they were telling lies. But, you know, our constructed realities have a force which is very powerful. So this is the first part of the narrative, which is that Kashmiri Pandits left, but they left all through 1990, 91, 92, 93, all the way to 98. They also left Kashmir at a time when India was going through a major, the earliest signs of the Hindutva phenomenon as we know it now. You know, 1992 was the demolition of the Babri Masjid, which in a sense marked a high point, you know. Or now, a low point. Or a low point. I mean, a high point of the Hindutva thing. So, uh, what happened is that they came out into an India and they were totally appropriated by the Hindu right wing. And that is a terrible, terrible tragedy. But who can argue that they did wrong? Because no one else was there to help them. The left was too busy working out the line by which time it was over, you know. Um, the Congress was not, I don't know, preoccupied with other things. So what happened is that they uh, kind of were appropriated and their story became completely um, uh, inseparable from the story of Hindutva. So the question, what about the Kashmiri Pandits, was actually not about the Kashmiri Pandits. Mm -hmm. It was a means of silencing the struggle in Kashmir. So for years in Delhi, if you had any event on Kashmir, the first question would be, what about Kashmiri Pandits? I, I reviewed a book recently, a, the first scholarly book on the Kashmiri Pandit migration, and I called it, what about the Kashmiri Pandits? Because till a point came in Delhi where suddenly I noticed that when somebody said that, the audience used to turn around and say, hey, you know what? We know that question, just sit down. I, we want to hear what these guys have to say. So, um, sadly, and, and that's a long conversation, sadly that uh, it wasn't simply that they were appropriated by the right wing, they also became, many of them, extremely right wing. And even today, they are very, very, I mean, there are a handful of, they, maybe they, there are many more exceptions quietly, but very few who are willing to speak about it. Yeah. And it continues to be like that. In a way, you could tie this question to um, previous question, there was a question um, because she led with the, the German case. And I think there's some really interesting overlaps here. Uh, Gunter Grass wrote a book called yeah. Crab Walk. And it was about the unacknowledged suffering <laughs> of, of Germans. Yes. That, the, that West Germany was busy trying to in a sense, exculpate itself, or come, not exculpate itself, but come to terms with the past, forgot to, uh, or couldn't address this, and then that becomes the fodder for, yes, yes. for the, 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 the rise of the radical right, which is now a, a big problem in Germany, obviously. Um, so I think that, that's really quite, quite fascinating. Um, it also feeds into Hindutva's narrative of victimization. This yes. is fundamental. Yes. And it's, it's, it's I think because where form. else in India were Hindus victims? You know what I mean? Right. So it's critical for them to borrow the victimhood yeah. of the Kashmiri Pandit right. because without it, they don't have an argument. Yeah. You know? What are they going to say? Like, oh, no, in five centuries ago, we were victimized. Right. You know? so, so this is a ready and cooking for you. you know? yeah. I, I have yes. one question, which is, um, I was thinking about the West Bank. And um, yeah. so when they made this plan, of getting rid of 370 and all of that stuff. Because of the close association of the Netanyahu government and the Modi government, yes. is, have you ever heard of a kind of a West Bank no, no. plant? It's, 
I, I, this is something I'm glad it's come up. So when the uh, siege began, in fact, that if you Google it, you might come across a close friend of mine who's the AP uh, reporter there, Ejaz Hussain. He wrote a very fine piece where he described the way the city was being barricaded. And you know, his, his is a more <coughs> truncated description. But briefly, uh, you come out of your house, you turn right, and it's blocked. You know, So you turn left, and then you know the way is actually where you want to go, you take a left, but you can't, so you take a right. And then, so it's not a logical route, but you keep going. And then when you've done your work, you want to come back, but you can't, because the barriers are one way. So you have to go around and, you know, you come back. Day two, you turn left because you think that's the one which is open, but it's not open today. You know, you have to turn right, and then you turn. So every day, the city shifts, and the guards, the, the, who, the paramilitary, are also rotated every day. So you can come out of your own house, and you'd imagine that that bunker knows you, but he doesn't, because he, he says, who are you? I don't know. You say you live in this house, but how do I know you live in this house? So that's at the crudest level. Um, surveillance, surveillance equipment, um, at least for the first two months, there were at any point 18 to 20 drones in the sky over Srinagar. There is extensive satellite surveillance. And um, there is, you know, the, uh, it, it's not a secret, the, the relationship between the, the IDAF. I mean, right now I, I saw it on my phone a day ago that the Indian Air Force is doing uh, exercises in Israel with the uh, special forces, the Israeli special forces. Uh, the uh, deputy chief of the IDAF was in Srinagar three years ago. Uh, I haven't heard of the deputy chief of the IDAF going to, you know, Bangalore or <laughs> Chennai or any place. So it was not a courtesy visit, obviously. Um, and police officers, senior middle-level police officers in uh, uh, Kashmir have trained with the Israelis, both in Israel and in Delhi. Um, that I, I do know, I mean... Uh, and um, this time around, there were rumors uh, that there were two teams. Uh, I hope this is not going to go into the video. Um, there were two teams, uh, uh, four uh, Israelis and four Americans. I don't know what that means. So yeah, there were outsiders around. Um, obviously, because of this whole communications problem, and you know, you can't even chat with your friends and freely and find out what's going on. But it's we are not speculating anymore. Uh, I mean, there is absolutely no doubt that the character of the siege in Kashmir right now uh, is using a completely different language and metaphor. It is not a familiar one, and it has all the hallmarks of the West Bank. Well, I think we've, we've come uh, to the end of the time that's been allotted to us. There's you know, a, a burning question comment, uh, I'd be happy to um, entertain it, but if not, um, I'd like to, on behalf of the Institute, Sansad and Hari Sharma, uh, thank you so so much, Sanjay, for coming. It's been a wonderful discussion. Um, it's, a, it's a magnificent, it's a magnificent book. Um, there are a few copies here. Um, I think you might have to rush down and get one before they, they, they uh, sell out. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.